Okay, good morning to all of you again. Uh, so, let me take up the questions which came up through the chat. Uh, some of them are fairly simple. So, first uh, uh, question that I take up is a very clarification question from BDT College center number 1176. The question was that uh, when I talk about force exerted uh, by Q1 at Q2, uh, if Q1 is at position R1, Q2 at R2, do I take R12 or R21? This is really a fairly straightforward question. Supposing you have a charge Q1 located at a position vector R1 and you want to find out what is the force on another charge which is located at a position vector Q2. So, this is R2. So, by vector addition you notice that this is R2 minus R1. So, the point is that when we write down the force between Q1 and Q2, uh, we will write down the force as 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q1 Q2 divided by R2 minus R1 square and R2 vector minus R1 vector. If Q1 Q2 is uh, they have opposite sign then of course, automatically the direction will change. Now, the point is that what do you want to write it? It is a question of a shorthand notation. Uh, usually, this is denoted by R12, but if you want to call it by R21, anyway, you have to make a statement that this is what I mean. It is your choice. In the shorthand notations never have any standard rule. So, this is this is uh, just Coulomb's law explanation. Sorry, this is cube. Uh, center number 1313. Um, the question is, um, why do you the eliminate del dot a. You remember that the question was based on del dot of a equal to 0, which I said is a there is a gauge choice. I said this is Coulomb gauge and I mentioned that if you have chosen a particular uh, a, then to that a I can add another gradient. So, I could define something called a a plus grad psi. So, then we said that look we have this, this is called a gauge choice. And I explained why, because you see the physically the only thing that is important is del cross A and del cross A is your magnetic field B. Now, you cannot eliminate it, you cannot choose del cross A to be something, because this is the physical quantity which you are interested in calculating. So, the choice is what is the del psi that you choose and that I said I even proved yesterday that even if initially you have chosen a gauge for which del dot i is not equal to 0. This is a choice you do not want it do not take it. Even if initially you have done that later on by solving a Poisson's equation it is possible to define an a prime such that del dot of a is equal to 0. So, this is this is always possible and so this is what makes sense physically. This is a physical field. Now, in this connection I would also quickly uh, try to answer because this is not really uh, within um, the scope of my lecture. Uh, remember yesterday I was uh, uh, giving an example of how one can establish the reality of A and the example that I gave in that connection is to say that suppose you are doing a Young's double slit experiment, but this time with uh, let us say an, uh, beam of electrons. Now, what I do is this that supposing I have a solenoid, supposing I have a solenoid and uh, I sort of make the two beams one go around it like this and another go around in front of it and the solenoid is small enough so that the physical path etcetera does not matter. So, when you look on a screen there would be interference pattern on this ignore the solenoids uh, current the, there is no current in the solenoid. Then I made a statement that look if you put on the current in the solenoid then you find that the fringe pattern is shifted. As we know that shift of fringe pattern is connected with the uh, presence of an additional phase. Now, there is nothing that has changed in this problem other than the fact that this solenoid has been 
given a current. As I said, uh, this is um, your Aronoff bomb effect. Now, the question that has been asked by somebody, I have uh, forgotten the name now, uh, but um, the is what gives you this change of phase? Now, that is not a question which unfortunately I can answer within classical electromagnetism. The problem is actually uh, the following that what you try to do is this that uh, uh, this is a pic uh, usually a quantum mechanical problem and you try to solve a quantum mechanical problem which take this as a free electron, take this as another free electron beam. As you know the free electron wave functions are given by i k dot x, this has been dot, uh, talked about in uh, your quantum mechanics lecture. So, uh, what we do is this that the we rewrite the Hamiltonian of the problem uh, instead of p square by 2 m uh, in the presence of a magnetic field. Uh, in it is known that the kinetic energy term becomes 1 over 2 m p minus E a by c, where a is actually the vector potential. This is of course, very well known to anybody who has done even a course in classical mechanics. So, basically you have to solve the Schrodinger equation in the presence of a vector potential. I will a uh, little while later point out how to calculate, how to write down a vector potential for a constant magnetic field. Now, this is an easy problem to solve and then what you find is that the wave function that you find uh, there, the, the solution of the Schrodinger equation that you find there, it picks up an additional phase because of the presence of A. Now, and it is that which is responsible for giving me the fringe shift. The point that I was trying to make is that since it is a solenoid, the solenoid has a magnetic field inside. B is not equal to 0 inside, you know that this is given by mu 0 n i. But B is equal to 0 outside the solenoid. But when you calculated, we found out an expression for A both inside and outside the solenoid. But A is such that del cross of A is equal to mu 0 n i inside and is equal to 0 outside. Remember, if a del cross of a quantity is 0, the quantity does not have to be 0. So, A has a value even outside and these two beams, one on that side, one on that side, they are not going inside the solenoid. So, they are not being exp exposed to a magnetic field but they are being exposed to a vector potential. And the vector potential as I told you, if you solve this problem in quantum mechanics, picks up an additional phase. And that is the reason why we get a fringe shift. As I said that this question cannot be answered completely classically, but since you have done several lectures on quantum mechanics, I thought it is not too inappropriate to mention it. Uh, next question came from Netaji Subhash Chandra Bosch Institute, Gwaria. 1 to 6, 6 centers. This question is on magnetic monopoles. Remember I mentioned to you uh, that uh, monopoles have not been found to exist. Now, the statement is monopoles have not been found to exist. I am not saying monopoles do not exist because I do not have that much of knowledge. So, the point is that uh, the originally uh, the, you will realize that the electromagnetic Maxwell's equations are asymmetric with respect to magnetism and electricity. And for the simple reason that electric single charges exist, but magnetism north poles and south poles must coexist together. This is what has been found. Nobody has really found out the reason why. Now, ever since Paul Dirac, Dirac of course, you must have heard the name, he had suggested that there is no reason why monopoles do not exist. Physicists have naturally been searching for monopoles, but so far the, the only problem is what has been found is that the monopoles if they exist, this was borne out even by Dirac's uh, calculations, they will be massive. By that what I mean is their energy will be huge. Now, in fact, the energy will be so huge that even the fastest accelerators 
may not be able to detect it. So, therefore, what one tries to do is that is there any monopoles which or were there any monopoles which existed in the early universe. Now, as you know that the physicists have been trying to reconstruct what happened in the early universe by many types of experiments and particularly experiments connected with LHC which takes care of very high uh, energy uh, particles. Uh, but so the searches are going on and the physicists uh, at this moment really speaking there is no great reason to believe that uh, uh, they will be found, but nevertheless uh, the there is no theoretical reason why the monopoles do not exist. So, therefore, uh, uh, the answer to that question is uh, let me end it with a uh, question mark. The next question again is a quick question uh, 1256 Hyderabad. Uh, the question that the is asked is that we discuss the method of images and in both cases I used gave two examples. In both cases I gave the example of a single charge located in front of or in the presence of a conductor. Actually it is not necessary that it is conductor method of images is even applicable to dielectrics, but let us not worry about that now because I did not have time to go through it. But in any case the method of images was illustrated with the presence of a charge. The question that our friend from Hyderabad wanted to ask is supposing instead of a single charge I had an charge cloud electron cloud for example, how would these things change. See the point is that technically there is no reason why the method of images which simply use two principles. One principle it used is that there is uniqueness theorem. So, uniqueness theorem simply said that uh, if Laplace's equation has a solution and I have found a solution that must be the only solution. There are no two solutions of Laplace's equation corresponding to a given boundary condition. So, therefore, there is no reason theoretically why when you put a electron cloud you will not be in a position to use the method of images. But however, the problem is that you see if you put an electron cloud the image will also be a cloud. So, therefore, you are going to lose this simple principle that we had that there was one ray coming from the image charge and another from the uh, charge which I call as the object charge and they, these two uh, the forces they cancelled because now there will be multiple forces between different members of that charge and one does not quite know how to handle it mathematically. So, method of images is a technique which is unlikely to work for this case though there is no reason why theoretically it is infeasible. Uh, the next question is from center number 1266 uh, which uh, is again I think from Calcutta. Uh, again uh, the question is uh, as a little tricky question. The question is why are there no dipole moments in dielectrics without an electric field? or why is there no dipole moment in the absence of E. So, let me first uh, make one statement. This statement is not even true, but on the other hand why did I say it is an interesting question. Why the statement is not true is this, the molecules do have permanent dipole moment. Molecules do have permanent dipole moment. In fact, classic example is water molecule. See if you look at the structure of water H 2 O. So, you the, the uh, molecule is not a symmetric molecule. So, you have this oxygen here and uh, the two hydrogens they are at an angle of 105 degrees to each other. There is a hydrogen here, there is a hydrogen there. An asymmetric molecule by in principle has an dipole moment and in fact water's dipole moment has been measured and it is 6.2 10 to the power minus 30 coulomb meter. So, this is actually the permanent dipole moment of the water molecule. Um, if you look at molecules which have mirror symmetry for example, uh, symmetric molecules like oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, uh, carbon tetrachloride these are all uh, mirror symmetric molecules these have no dipole moment. And the reason is very simple 
that if the molecule is symmetrical, then of course, the charge centers will be at the uh, center itself. Uh, I still um, think that a statement I should make on why did this question come up. Okay? So, why no dipole moment? This question came up primarily because uh, of uh, certain popular writings that have been coming up, but on the other hand because you some of us may not have enough background to understand in what connection they have been written. See the point is there has been a question of why the uh, 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 fundamental particles, uh, by that I mean uh, uh, the uh, you know the, the constituents of matter, the why do not they have dipole moment. So, uh, a distributed system like molecules of course, have a dipole, dipole moment, but on the other hand the dipole moment has not been found okay, in uh, things which are fundamental molecules. The reason is a little tricky. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, once again, there is no reason why it should not be there, but uh, they, they, it has not been found. The for reasons that I cannot go to right now, it turns out that the of course really it's sort of intuitive that um, having a permanent dipole moment would violate what is known as parity situation, and um, the uh, actually it turns out. Uh, you probably have all heard of that parity can actually be violated, but on the other hand people have not been able to find uh, the situation of having a dipole moment in uh, systems like this. Another quick question, uh, so I wanted to point out that the question on dipole moment was interesting, but the way it has been phrased that why are there no dipole moment in molecules is incorrect, because molecules do have permanent dipole moment in the absence of um, electric field, but the write ups that you occasionally read are connected with that uh, there are no dipole moments in the um, fundamental particles of the uh, nature. Uh, the next question again is a very straightforward query, center number 1313, uh, it is asking that uh, why do you put a negative sign before the scalar potential? Why electric field should be minus gradient of phi? Quick reason, no particular reason. In fact, the mathematicians use uh, the definition of scalar potential as uh, just E equal to del phi, uh, but you realize the mathematicians are not dealing with physical fields. They are dealing with that if there is a vector field, if there is a vector field whose curl is equal to 0, then that vector field can be expressed as a gradient of a scalar function, scalar field. Now, that is the way the mathematicians look at. That is not quite the way the physicists, physicists would look at it. The physicists would say, they put a minus sign for the simple reason that look at, say I have a gravity. Now, I know the gravitational force F is minus m g z, z is uh, unit vector z, it is downward. Now, this I cannot change, its direction is known. Now, if I now define a potential without this minus sign, then suppose, suppose, suppose we say that my uh, gravitational force is uh, uh, written as instead of minus del phi, I write it as plus del phi. then the expression for my phi will be minus m g z that is a height or h okay, plus a constant. Now, there is no problem there, excepting this should mean that if the height uh, decreases, the system has more potential energy, unless you want to change the whole thing. Uh, the, this type of changes if you want would also need to be to correct for example, the torque expression which is E cross P, right? P cross E, it should now become E cross P. Now, so therefore, what I am trying to say, this is just a convention, this is just a convention, uh, this is to keep, uh, um, be consistent with the fact that we know that the potential energy is defined such that higher the height more is the potential energy etcetera etcetera. Okay. Another quick question, 
um, was uh, uh, the uh, from center um, well i am not very sure whether this was actually asked from 1313 or not but probably 1299 but there was one of them asked a question that um, um, the you know is the decomposition of a vector uh, the same as resolution of a vector the answer is yes it's just a uh, english language that we use okay there's a question on dielectric by 1020 uh, the question was that we talked about uh, rho b bound charge volume charges and sigma b now the question is this that since there are no free charges inside a dielectric why take these two into account because the total charge enclosed is zero that statement is not true see the point is what we said is that the total polarization charge is zero that the polarization charge has two components the one of the components is the volume component the other component is the surface component now it is the volume component plus the surface component total charge that would cancel out in a neutral medium but on the other hand since i know for example when i have a uniformly um, charged sphere non conducting sphere of course i calculate that how much charge is contained inside at a distance r that's a separate question but you see if i do this take such a gaussian volume then it doesn't enclose any charges on the surface if you take the total surface area of course both of them have to be taken care of and there are no polarization charges inside but because there are volume charges and surface charges so you have to put it in the integral expressions there okay i think another then another quick question before i take up the last question which will take a bit of a time is from center 1225 uh, which asked why did i use the word virtual charge the reason for using the statement virtual charge phrase virtual charge was primarily because i have been using the language of optics you know that when you stand in front of a mirror you have an image and that image is virtual the image is virtual because you will not be able to put a screen at an equal distance behind this uh, mirror and catch it you know that real images can be focused on a screen the virtual images cannot so uh, in that sense that an image by a mirror uh, particularly plane mirror uh, because in case of uh, spherical mirrors we may even have situation where we have a real image these are virtual so in the method of images i have been saying imagine a charge q prime put for example in case of the plane behind the conductor now we know that behind the conductor behind the conductor i have material body of the conductor there are no real uh, charges floating around there so this is an imagined charge that if it were there then i would be able to do it so that's a quick question next question was uh, the lots of uh, questions but one of the centers i have is 1158 the question asked is can you discuss the boundary conditions that are applicable at the interface between two dielectric media the reason why i am taking this question in a bit of a detail is that this is a very relevant and a practical situation see as you know light rays are nothing but electromagnetic waves i know for example when you have a ray of light falling on let us say a glass medium uh, interface between glass and air let us say then what happens is that here is a ray coming in and uh, you have of course a reflected ray and you have a transmitted ray. Now we will see later that if you want to prove this is called uh, well one is law of reflection angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection the second one is called the Snell's law which simply says that the velocity in the uh, second medium divided by the velocity in the uh, first medium or rather the other way around velocity in air divided by the velocity in this 
is the refractive index of the medium and that is equal to uh, sin of the incident angle divided by the sin of the uh, refracted angle. So, this is your theta i, this is your theta transmitted. Now, uh, we have of course, in school learnt that uh, this is given, but this is not really given. One can derive this from electromagnetic theory and the way one derives them from electromagnetic theory is to find out what is the ray of light which is falling is an electromagnetic wave. So, therefore, I have to worry about electric field. Now, this electric field when it falls from one uh, dielectric medium, this in this case it is air to the second dielectric medium, in this case it is glass, then I have to satisfy the condition at the surface. Certain amount of uh, continuity conditions have to be sub applied on the surface. Remember, if this was an interface between air and a conductor, then we would have said that if there are free charges on the surface of the conductor, then the normal component of the electric field is discontinuous, but the tangential component should be continuous. It is the tangential components continuity that will uh, lead us to the law of reflection, refraction etcetera. Now, so therefore, it is important to understand what are the boundary conditions at the interface between the dielectrics. So, though it is something which I took it up previous day, but because it takes a bit of a time I did not take it up yesterday. So, let us look at supposing these are two, I, I have two dielectric medium remember that is no, no longer conductor. So, let me take one of the dielectric medium to be air the, and the other one glass or whatever you have. Now, again if you recall the way we found out the uh, continuity condition in case of a uh, conductor, we said that take a Gaussian pillbox, part of it outside the uh, conductor and part of it inside the conductor. Now, we had a great advantage there because as we know inside a conductor there were no electric field. So, now you remember what we do in case of a Gaussian pillbox, we ultimately reduce the size of this to 0 or uh, negligible, so that there is no contribution to the flux, electric flux from the sides of the cylinder. And the, there are no contribution to the flux in case of a conductor from the part of the base which is inside the conductor. Now, so I have only one side. Now, this is not really true when I talk about the situation that happens in case of a dielectric. So, let us let us proceed with that again. So, let me draw that picture once more. So, I have this Gaussian pillbox, part of it is inside, part of it outside. The way this derivation differs from what we did in case of a conductor is, I again as I take this height to be negligible, there is no contribution to the surface integral from the two sides. But now, I have both the faces because previously the electric field was 0 inside the conductor, but now I have polarization charges. Now, I have polarization charges inside the dielectric. Let us assume for the moment that there are no free charges on the surface. Okay? There, there could be free charges on the surface. Now, if no free charges on the surface, then I deal only with the polarization charge. Now, so what would be my situation? Notice this, that the normal on this face is n, normal on this face is opposite direction. So, n prime is equal to minus n. So, what we said is this, that look, what is my del dot E volume integral? So, we said that this is equal to 1 over epsilon 0 rho b, this is nothing but my Maxwell's equation. Del dot E is rho divided by epsilon 0, I have integrated both sides, but, but rho b now is not, say remember Max, my Maxwell's equation was del dot of E equal to rho by epsilon 0, but now I have only bound charges. There are no free charges because I am talking about dielectrics and I have said that there are no free charges. Okay. So, if there are no free charges, del dot of P is simply equal to rho bound divided by epsilon 0, I have integrated both sides. 
Now, I also showed yesterday that this is equal to 1 over epsilon 0, rho b is minus del dot of p, okay, dq bar. If you compare these two expressions now, what I am going to get the left hand side becomes by uh, divergence theorem is e dot d s and the right hand side has now picked up a minus sign. So, I have got minus 1 over epsilon 0 p dot d s. Now, but, but look at this quantity, what is this quantity? This is minus 1 over epsilon 0 p dot d s is nothing but the surface charge density uh, that we have in the problem. So, that is delta b times the of course, the surface area delta s. Now, if you now realize what is e dot d s by taking uh, the fact that there is uh, this surface and that surface take the surface to be small enough. So, you get E outward minus E inward normal component of that because it is surface integral that is equal to sigma b divided by epsilon 0. Okay? This is what you get. The, um, so, this you notice this expression is essentially the same as that of a conductor. The expression is the same as that of a conductor excepting that instead of the surface charge density being free charge density, I now have a bound charge density. Now, supposing I had both, supposing my surface had uh, some free charges, then this would be replaced by sigma free plus sigma bound, both the charges are there in the contribution. And, and the reason for this minus sign is remember sigma b outside the, uh, uh, the dielectric is 0, there is sigma b only from this side. So, it picks up that additional minus sign there. So, this is this is the way the normal component of the electric field will have a discontinuity. This is the same as that of the conductor and this is the correction due to the uh, bound charges. Now, this is very easy to write in terms of the d vector that I introduced. We said the vector d is epsilon 0 e plus p. So, substitute these there in my definition okay? and remember that outside the medium sigma b is equal to 0. A little trivial arithmetic tells you d outside normal component minus d inside normal component this is simply given by sigma f that is free. Sigma b cancels out because of this definition, okay? which means which is a very simplifying fact that if there is no free charge on the surface, normal component of d is continuous because if sigma f is equal to 0, this quantity on the right becomes equal to 0. Tangential component, the same old rule is applicable. E uh, out tangential is still continuous about E in. These two are the boundary conditions to be satisfied at the uh, interface between two dielectrics. In our case, may be air Mib and glass. Now, that essentially brings me to the end of the chat sessions that we had yesterday and if some questions have not been answered, it means it has been answered by other people's question. Uh, the other possibility is that the question does not quite fall into my uh, whatever I am doing. Okay. Having disposed of the chats that came yesterday, uh, let me uh, take off from where I started. So, I was uh, telling you that this is actually uh, more in the sense of a problem that uh, very frequently you uh, use uniform magnetic field. And so, therefore, I need to have a ready made uh, answer for what is the uh, vector potential corresponding to a uniform or a constant magnetic field. Let us take the magnetic field to be in the z direction. Now, my claim is uh, A of r the vector potential 
at the position r is given by the cross product of b with r divided by 2. If you take this, remember uh, this is obviously not unique. It is not unique because a r is never unique. To, to this I can add the gradient of any scalar function. So, look at what is del dot of a. So, essentially I am doing what is del dot of b cross r. Now, if you look up any calculus book, it will tell you that the del dot of b cross r, it is more like a, uh, a chain rule differentiation, excepting that because there are cross product, you have some minus signs coming in. It will turn out to be r dot del cross b minus b dot del cross r. Now, it is a, it takes one minute to calculate the del cross r that is the curl of the position vector and show that this is equal to 0. So, I am left with del dot of a equal to half r dot del cross b, but uh, the if you look at the, uh, so this is 0 uh, because b is constant. So, del cross of a constant field has to be 0. Remember I am trying to find out the vector potential of a uniform magnetic field, a constant magnetic field. So, I cannot differentiate a constant and get a non-zero value. So, this term is 0. This term is 0 because del cross of r is equal to 0. So, this uh, choice of b cross r by 2 satisfies that 2 is unimportant, but you, we choose it to give me the correct magnetic field. This uh, uh, gives me the right uh, gauge choice namely del dot of a is equal to 0. So, I have done that and uh, del cross you can immediately calculate the del cross and show that this indeed is equal to uh, uh, b. Um, now, so there are two choices which are very frequently done. One is to say that x component of the uh, vector potential is minus b y by 2 and y component is b into x by 2. This is one choice and this if you, you can calculate del cross of a and you will find that this is equal to b. Instead, you need not have these factors 2 there and make the second component 0, write this as minus b y 0 0 and again you will find that the del cross of a is equal to b. Now, if you worked both of these out, you will find that the difference between these two form of a is that these two differ by a del of b times x y by 2. You can check it immediately because this is del of b times x y by 2 is just the difference that you are having. So, the reason I am pointing it out is very important to almost remember what is the expression that you take for the vector potential of a uniform magnetic field. I mean either this or this. This is more commonly used. Okay. Since we have been talking about boundary conditions, we have finished about conductor, we have talked about uh, uh, your uh, uh, dielectrics and things like that. Supposing I have a current carrying surface. In this example, uh, so this is this the, the I have a sheet of current essentially. Uh, the current's direction is coming out. So, please understand that this brown color thing that you are seeing actually represents the uh, uh, intersection of the surface with the paper or with the screen. So, therefore, the surface is perpendicular to the screen and so therefore, the direction of the current is out of the paper. This is the direction I have taken, the current is coming out of the paper. Now, I want to find out the boundary conditions that must be applicable on such surfaces. Remember again our uh, statement that if I have uh, a charged surface, then my normal component for the electrostatics, then my normal component of the electric field has a discontinuity but the tangential component is continuous. In case of the corresponding magnetic situation, the situation is reverse as you can see it and this is because of the Gauss's law. So, I take again a Gaussian pill box. Now, remember my b dot d s must be equal to 0 always. So, therefore, if these heights go to 0 negligible, then I have my uh, b dot d s which is simply s times b 2 n minus b 1 n because the normal directions are opposite. right? But now previously my e dot d s was equal to charge enclosed, but I do not have a charge enclosed now. So, when I had electrostatics, we said the integral of e dot d s 
is 1 over epsilon 0 times charge enclosed. But now, integral of b dot d s is 0, there is no charge enclosed. So, therefore, s b 2 n minus b 1 n, the previous case we have e 2 n minus e 1 n is equal to the whatever is the charge density that you had. But now, this side is 0. So, therefore, I have b 2 n is equal to b 1 n. Right? So, this simply means that the normal component of B is continuous. Supposing you are working in a Coulomb gauge, I know I have del dot of A is equal to 0 and you can immediately show that it means the normal component of the magnetic vector potential is also continuous. What about the tangential component? Remember the tangential component in case of the electric field uh, was continuous, the, the normal component was discontinuous. Now, here again I have the same situation but my problem is now reverse. My normal component of the magnetic field is continuous, but it turns out that if there are surface currents, if there are surface currents, the, the situation is parallel to what happened in case of uh, surfaces having uh, charges. Now, we are saying if I have surface currents, then the tangential component of B will be discontinuous. Now, one can immediately see it, why? See, remember I told you the direction of the current, direction of the current on the surface okay, is coming out. So, let us call it uh, the what the our direction is uh, that of uh, uh, let us say the S direction. Now, the normal to the surface okay, is on this, okay, this, this is the surface normal and I define a tangential direction also. So, I such that I define a system of axis such that this s which is the direction in which is coming out the normal to the surface which is the intersection is in the plane of the paper and another tangential direction which is perpendicular to it this is the tangential direction. These are a right handed system namely t is equal to n cross s n is equal to s cross t etcetera etcetera. Now, what I do is this I do exactly what I did in case of electrostatics. I take an Amperean loop with small heights and I say integral of b dot d l equal to mu 0 i. Now, remember that in the uh, other case, uh, it is important to understand why different uh, boundary conditions are arising for electrostatics and for magnetostatics. See in electrostatics, the normal component was discontinuous because e dot d s was not equal to 0 but b dot d s was equal to 0. But now, because of the fact the electrostatic field is a conservative field, curl of E equal to 0. In other words, integral of E dot d l is equal to 0. But in this case, I do not have that. Magnetic field is not a conservative field. Integral b dot d l instead of being 0 by Ampere's law is mu 0 i. So, therefore, if I take the Amperean loop and write this down, if the surface charge density is written by j. So, I have mu 0 j integral j dot d s and of course, I have put in the area there. So, you take this integral out you know I mean contribution only from here and there that is b 2 t minus b 1 t, t meaning tangential is given by this. So, there is a discontinuity, there is a discontinuity in the tangential component of the magnetic field at the surface and this is simply rewriting it in the nature of a vector. Having done that, uh, I spent a lot of time in uh, discussing dielectric. Now, because the techniques are similar, we do not need to spend a lot of time in studying magnetostatics also. We have seen that every time I am teaching magnetostatics, I am pointing out remember what happened in case of electrostatics because the mathematics everything is the same. Let us do that as to what is happening here. Now, I have magnetic material. Uh, of course, you are all very familiar with the magnetic material. The magnetic material that we have uh, are because of the following things. You see, ultimately, my matter ha consists of atoms, and in a in a very gr uh, crude level, the atoms have electrons. These electrons are moving around. Now, moving electrons are moving charges. 
So, they are responsible for atomic currents. So, basically as you have done the picture of an atom is around a positive charge the electrons or some charge is moving around. So, this part is understandable classically this is the orbital motion. There is a second motion there is a second contribution to the atomic current and that is due to the spin motion of the electrons. Now, though in many school books you will find a comparison that orbital motion is like the earth moving around the sun, the spin motion is like the earth moving about itself. Please understand the second comparison is a meaningless comparison, second comparison because electron is not moving around itself and that is not the reason for giving me spin. Spin unfortunately is a concept which cannot be explained on the basis of classical physics. Spin is purely quantum. So, spin of an electron or other fundamental particles are intrinsic, are intrinsic. In fact, you know that neutron has a spin magnetic moment though it is neutral. Okay? So, we cannot really discuss spin in any uh, understandable way when we are discussing classical physics. But let us look at what happens. Let us let us just talk about the orbital motion. Now, you see uh, so I have electrons moving around in a circuit enclosing obviously a uh, certain area. Now, when I put in a magnetic field there is an attempt there is an attempt to increase the flux through the atomic uh, the, the whatever uh, circuit which the moving electrons are occupying. Now, this will mean this will mean that there is an attempt to change the flux through the uh, area which is being spanned by the atomic moments. Now, we will learn in our next lecture that the or you already know it anyway that Faraday's law will tell you that this means that the currents must change or adjust themselves to oppose such a change. Now, this is the reason for diamagnetism. Diamagnetism is there in all materials because the origin of diamagnetism is the uh, Faraday's law. We will have more to talk about Faraday's law in the next lecture. The other thing is uh, paramagnetism this is primarily I am talking about the spin motion of the electrons or the spin of the electrons. So, again if you want to look at it in a very crude way the picture that I gave uh, for the dielectric is uh, still applicable here. That is what we say is that uh, a random piece of iron is not magnetic and that is because a, a random piece of iron inside has presence of small domains. Each domain has a magnetic moment, but at an arbitrary temperature in the absence of the magnetic field these domains have their magnetic moments which are aligned in arbitrary random directions and as a result the total magnetic moment adds up to 0. Now, that is a paramagnet that is a paramagnet. Now, when you put in a magnetic field these domains the magnetic moment of these domains they try to align in the direction of the magnetic field which leads to a net magnetic moment of this sample. And there are of course, other things that if you make the magnetic field strong enough once all the domains have their uh, magnetic moments aligned there is nothing more to align. So, the magnetization saturates and that is uh, what we are talking about is a ferromagnetic situation. But in any case there are two basic processes one is diamagnetism arising out of the orbital motion of the electron and because the Faraday's law will say that if you are trying to change the flux through the atomic circuits then the internal currents that are there they will try to oppose it. So, all materials are diamagnetism to a greater or lesser degree. The paramagnetism as I told you arises because at a given temperature at an arbitrary temperature in the absence of a magnetic field 
the spin magnetic moments are aligned arbitrarily and it is only when you put in a magnetic field they would try to align themselves. So, this is what we talked about in the preceding couple of minutes. So, therefore, my total current, my total current consists of two parts. I have of course, the conduction current which is due to the uh, bulk transports that is the macroscopic charge transports and I have the currents inside, currents inside which are atomic currents, but since I cannot deal with them individually, I deal with them in an average way. Once again, I want to point out, please understand what we talked about in case of electrostatics. We said there are charges, there are free charges in a metal for example. And in a dielectric, there are these uh, uh, the charges which are bound. So, basically I am talking about the same thing in a different language. We said there are these free electrons or free charges which are moving okay? and that gives me what you can call as the conduction current. And then there are the internal currents which in some sense are bound to the atoms which are there. See there are, all, there are also currents, but there are currents localized within an atom or a molecule. Now, I define the magnetization. Remember I defined polarization as net electric dipole moment per unit volume. I define magnetization vector m as net magnetic moment vector per unit volume. This is a v and as of course, delta v going to 0. So, once again a very parallel definition. So, having done that, let us calculate now uh, the vector potential of a magnetic material. So, what do you do there? So, what I do is I split my material, magnetic material into small domains. Let us take an infinitesimal small domain having a magnetic momentum and uh, the origin is here, the position of the magnetic moment is here. And this is the point at which I want to calculate the vector potential. Now, remember my vector potential expressions I had given you earlier, there was in terms of that it was in the direction of the current. So, therefore, the corresponding expression happens to be mu 0 by 4 pi m which is the magnetic moment cross r by r cube. So, this is this is basically like bias of law that the vector potential due to the magnetic moment. Remember the magnetic moment is defined in terms of the um, your uh, the loop area times the current itself. So, the vector potential which we had shown it to be in the direction of current. So, this is the expression that you get. So, if I now sum it over all the materials, then this expression becomes then mu 0 by 4 pi magnetization at r prime cross r minus r prime by r minus r prime cube d cube r. So, what has happened? There was a conduction current earlier there that role has been taken over by magnetism current. The expression, the mathematics and everything remains the same. So, this is my A of R. So, so this is what I did. Now, what I do is I am not going to be redoing this algebra again because that is the reason why we spent a lot of time in working it out in electrostatics. Remember one of the ways in which this is done is write it as M R prime cross del prime of 1 over r minus r prime because uh, this is r minus r prime by r minus r prime cube is nothing but minus gradient of 1 over r minus r prime, but that gradient is taken with respect to r. Here I am taking a gradient with respect to r prime. So, therefore, no minus sign. So, this is what it is. Now, you, you notice that this is something like a uh, m prime cross gradient of something. Now, you can use your vector algebra and say that del cross of scalar time a vector is given by this and I had essentially this expression. So, it is this minus this and that is what I have done here. I have said this quantity is del cross of this into this and a compensating term from here. So, that is the way it is. If you it would be instructive for you to compare this expression with what we did in case of electrostatics. We said there that there are two expressions there of course, the cross did not come, okay. but important point was 
that we split it exactly into two parts. One of the parts I kept it as a volume integral, the other part I converted into a surface integral and this is precisely what I am going to do now. So, this is my expression. Since this is del cross acting on d q bar, the, this becomes a surface integral immediately. The other one stays like that. The algebra, the method, everything is identical. So, if you look at it now and come back to the comparison which we made, we notice that there is a surface component here and there is a volume component there. And then you compare it with that what happens then? What you find is that if you calculate my del cross b, I have consisting of two terms. One is the pure magnetization term. Okay? So, this is my j m del cross m and there is a surface term. The surface term is what I showed you here. There is a surface term and there is a volume term. And of course, add to that my uh, the usual conduction current. So, this is the expression that we said, we said all right, you now calculate the del cross of that quantity. Now, you do the do a bit of an algebra and you find del cross of b happens to be equal to mu 0 del cross m and this quantity del cross m is my has the dimension of current density and is equal to j m volume. So, the comparison is 1 to 1, comparison is 1 to 1, I have the Ampere's law earlier which was del cross b equal to mu 0 j, but now I am saying in addition to the conduction current which is treated exactly the same way as we did earlier. Now, there is a contribution to the volume current okay, due to the atomic things because they are there. Now, so let us summarize the Maxwell's equation that we have got so far. So, my integral b dot d l which was earlier mu 0 i has two parts one is mu 0 times conduction current plus I m and I m I have said is del cross m dot d s and that is nothing but m dot d l by again by applying Stokes law. So, like we defined like we defined a displacement vector d or d vector d I can define a different quantity because this b dot d l and here I m is m dot d l. So, but there is a mu 0 there. So, take that mu 0 on the other side. So, I define b by mu 0 minus m. Remember we had defined uh, epsilon 0 uh, e uh, plus p, but this is b by mu 0 minus m. This is defined as a h vector. This is defined as an h vector and the corresponding Ampere's law for h will be h dot d l equal to i c, where i c is the conduction current. Now, once again notice the similarity. When we talked about the electrostatics, our d vector integral of uh, the d vector was determined by entirely by real charges, true charges, free charges. Now, we are saying the h vector is determined in terms of true con conduction currents only, the free currents not by bound currents. So, similarity the electric vector E determined by the actual net charge which has both the polarization charge and the free charge. Correspondingly, the vector B is determined by total currents. The corresponding expression for B dot d L is mu 0 times i. This is the, this is the full, this is here both the conduction current and the internal currents, but h dot d l like d is determined by only the conduction part. Remember that d was determined only by my free charges. Finally, before I close this uh, not I do not close the session, but I am closing this discussion of magnetostatics. Uh, we uh, just end it with some definitions that uh, very often we have linear magnetic material where the magnetization is proportional to h. You write magnetization that proportionality constant is usually called the susceptibility if it is a linear material. So, therefore, B 
can be written as in this fashion and this is then called permeability. If you remember mu 0 was called permeability of the vacuum. Now, 1 plus chi that is the susceptibility is the way the permeability factor is modified in a linear material not in general, in general it could be different. Okay? So, this is this is the way that we uh, complete the discussion of electrostatics. So, by uh, finishing electrostatic uh, electrostatics and magnetostatics, we have been able to get into all the time independent component of the Maxwell's equation. In next few minutes that I have and in the second lecture, I will now bring in time dependence phenomena. If there are queries connected with what we are discussing right now, okay, uh, I will take it up and uh, of course, as usual if I do not have time, I will take it up in 1330 which is uh, Motilal Nehru. Yeah, go ahead please. What is the difference between insulator and dielectric? How can we explain this to the students? Are you asking what is the difference between an insulator and a dielectric? Yes, sir. Yes. There is none. See, the point is this that the when you are discussing the material properties uh, of uh, a substance in relation to whether it is a conductor or not. Okay? The materials are classified as conducting if there are free charges and if there are no free charges they are considered to be dielectric. The word insulator, okay, as you know that in terms of conductivity properties, the substances are uh, classified differently. They are talked about as conductors, the insulators I mean and also there are semiconductors, but you remember the semiconductors is closer to an insulator than to a conductor because accepting that the band gap there is substantially less than that of an insulator. So, basically an insulator is a perfect dielectric if you like, but on the other hand if I have materials which do not have uh, free charges, I call it a dielectric. The in study of electromagnetism excepting when we are talking about the conductivity property, the word insulator is not used. But but they, an insulator and dielectric are similar. Is that Meghnath Saha Institute? Yes, from somewhere in West Bengal. Yes, go ahead. We uh, talked about displacement uh, vector and that is given by epsilon 0 e plus p. Yes. That is the polarization. Right? Right. And we right. find polarization as a uh, uh, total number of dipole per unit volume. Yes. Right? It is not number of dipoles, it is net dipole moment added vectorially and then divided by the volume, yes. Yes. So, dimensionally it is fine that it uh, represents a uh, dimension of field, right. no problem. Right. Then physically, right. I mean, how could we uh, I mean, uh, realize that this uh, polarization is some sort of field? Well, you see the point is that what you know that we go back to the first class that we had, first hour, what is a field? Okay. The field was there are we talked about scalar field, we talked about vector field and things like that. Okay? The vector field is a field which is a point function defined at every point but has a direction. Okay? So, that was a vector field. Now, the polarization as I have defined, remember I said that per unit volume yes, but we also said that it is defined in a point way. In other words, what you actually do is to take a small enough volume, find out what is the net direction of the dipole moment in that, divide it by that volume. So, therefore, now that the volume uh, thing has cancelled out from both numerator and denominator, what you have got is polarization per, you see this is similar to the way the density, mass density for example, is a uh, point function. Because what you do even though you say that density is mass per unit volume. It does not mean that you take 1 meter cube of the mass and then find out how much is that mass. What you actually do is to take any small volume, let that volume go to 0 okay, and divide the mass of contained in that divided by the volume and in that sense it is called mass per unit volume. In that sense this is called polarization dipole moment per unit volume. So, 
it is a vector point vector, it is defined from point to point and so therefore, it is a field. And the fact that it has a, a uh, the it gives rise to a measurable electric property, that is if you put up a charge there, it will experience a force is of course, automatic because that is the way we defined it. Remember it was defined electric field on the other hand E field, the E field is something which a test charge would actually feel. So, this is something which I can experimentally determine. The polarization quantity I determine uh, by uh, the conceptually. I can determine of course, the magnetic moment per unit volume. Yes. We can realize the origin of uh, electric field, yes. right? And yeah. then uh, we, we uh, yeah. talked about polarization that is P, and then we add it with E to yeah. have the total displacement vector. Uh, I can realize conceptually that P will have the dimension of electric field, yeah. no problem. Yeah. But on what basis? I mean, physically, on what, on what basis we are adding it uh, with electric field to find out the net? Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you what. See, suppose I don't have a charged object. Okay, but I just have a dielectric. Now, if I have a dielectric, now remember though this thing is electrically neutral, but microscopically that macroscopic body has an electric structure. You know that is the reason why I spent a bit of a time in doing a multiple expansion. And then we found that to the, the our leading term is not just a matter of charge, but it is also the fact that the charge separation takes place. So, I basically if I have a dipole, in, in fact the question is very properly answered. See, we said a dipole is basically two opposite charges separated by a small distance. Now, if this distance becomes 0, then of course, there is no charge at all in that. But if you do it in a limiting sense, the dipole has a moment and it has an electric field, because when I take any point outside, the distance from the positive charge and the negative charge, though minutely different, but they are different. So, therefore, a dipole technically is also a source of electric field, you know we calculate this all the time and given it in terms of the thing. So, therefore, and now I have a collection of dipoles, that is all, thank you. Okay, uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, we talked about this multiple expansion and then we uh, concentrated about two terms. Yes. One uh, which gives one was just a point, point source term. Yes. I mean the monopole term I ignored. Right. The dipole term. Yeah. We we uh, had the potential and then we had uh, two terms. One is minus at the, uh, divergence p. Another term was p dot n cap. Right. Right. Then we associated uh, them. This is, this is just the way charge. we could divide it, yes, go ahead. Yes, charge and the second one with the surface charge, right. bound charge, right. both of them, right. right. This is the physical right. significance of this uh, volume bound charge, because yes. as I can understand, when we are talking about these dipoles, they are they come in pairs, right, yes. Yes. and if uh, they carry equal and opposite charges. Right. So, if I consider a small volume, uh, there I would find net charge 0, yes. then how do you define this volume charge? bound charge to be non-zero and this, then you. This is, this you are, you have now come back to in such a situation there is no contribution to the first term. But you see now I am looking at the moment term, okay. The, you are tied like my total charge is zero, but the dipole moment is not zero, okay. So, you are absolutely right that if I am only looking at that, then I do not have a term which consists of total charge. In neutral material I do not take that term at all. But that does not mean that the dipole or the quadrupole term is 0. The quadrupole of course, is too small for us to look at. But of course, as you know nuclear physicists worry about quadrupoles. There was a question on quadrupole, but uh, that is a male question I will answer it later. But so, so please do not be under the impression, see the total charge is 0, you are absolutely correct. Total charge is 0 for a dipole also. Even in the limiting sense, the total charge of a dipole is 0. But, but the dipole moment is not 0, that is the way you define a dipole. And so, th because of that 
I have a contribution there. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Which uh, place is it? This is Somaya College, local Bombay. Yeah, go ahead. When we talk about uh, electric and magnetic potentials, yes, electric potential uh, has some practical implication like uh, potential difference of or voltage. In uh, what situation the magnetic potential uh, becomes uh, relevant? You know, good question you asked, but if you recall, I spent a bit of a time in the morning in explaining that. Uh, electric potential, you see, it is a question of your familiarity. Electric uh, processes are things. Now, for example, gravitational potential, you do not use that word, but people who work with gravity, they use it all the time because they are exactly the same. They are they accepting that the gravitational force is always attractive, but there is no difference between the nature of the forces. The, the problem of the magnetic potential is that the, it is it is not unique, but you will say so is the scalar potential not unique. But the difference is the following. A vector potential has a gauge choice associated with it. So, corresponding to the same situation, I can choose different vector potentials as long as they differ only by the gradient of a scalar function. Now, the question was that what is the use? Now, because of this reason that it is a choice of a gauge and all that, the effect of this is very difficult to demonstrate. The mathematically it is a very useful thing, because just the way you say electric field is minus gradient of phi, I say magnetic field is del cross A. But remember, it is not, you know, I mean not as um, elegant as talking about a scalar, because scalars are much easier to deal with than vectors. So, I have not really gained anything by defining a vector potential, because my magnetic field was a vector, I am expressing it as a vector of another del cross of another quantity which is a vector. So, I have not gained much. In case of electrostatics, the scalar potential gave me a great advantage, because the number, they being scalars I could simply add them up. But vector potential adding is going to be very difficult, because they are vectors. So, but on the other hand, the, that is the reason why I talked about a very elegant experiment in the morning called the Aronoff bomb effect. See the what I told you there is the vector potential has a physical effect which you can see. Okay. See while the scalar potential is simply a mathematical device which made your calculations easy because they were scalars. Now my vector potential is does not make my calculation that easy. Okay. But on the other hand, this Aronoff bomb effect showed that you see what was the Aronoff bomb effect? We said inside a solenoid field is non-zero, outside it is zero. Magnetic vector potential the way I have chosen is non-zero both inside and outside. So, now this problem I could not handle here, but it is very easy to work out with quantum mechanics and see that that leads to a change in phase. I would since all of you are teachers, I would uh, request you to look up okay, and read this beautiful uh, thing about what is Aronoff bomb effect. Okay. So, there is a lot of interest there. Marathawada Institute of Technology? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Good morning, sir. My question is, uh, you said uh, a steady line charge uh, produces magnetic field uh, for an observer who is moving. Okay. So, my first question is, is it experimentally verified? And my second question is, suppose the observer is steady and charge starts moving, yes. then it becomes the case of time varying field. Okay, let me explain. See, what I said is this, you have a steady line charge. Okay. The line charge is static, but you realize that it is static provided you are sitting down with respect to that line, it is in your lab there is a line charge or any charge and you are static, then only that charge is static. But as we know, the velocities are always relative. So, if the observer started moving, the I have given a line charge just to provide it a long enough, supposing it is a closed circuit. But then if I start moving, I think that with respect to me those charges are moving. Now, if the charges are moving, that is equivalent to a current. 
a current should give me a magnetic field. Now, what I said is the following. Let me let me take a couple of minutes. This will be the last question I will take up in this session. What we said is this that supposing I have an observer static inside a lab, the, he sees only a line charge. He sees a line charge and he can calculate what is the field due to that line charge. Now, he can not only calculate, but he can put a test charge somewhere, find the force on that test charge. Mu 0 electric field is given by lambda by 2 pi, 2 pi epsilon 0 r and you can calculate how much is the electric field. Statement number 1. Statement number 2 is now let a person move walk in a direction or move in a direction run in a direction parallel to the direction of that charge parallel to a direction of that line. So, with respect to him the charges which were there are now moving in the reverse direction. Now, but he has now learned relativity which he will do it a little later. So, he says that look if I have a length and I am moving along the line of length, the length gets contracted. But there is no way that he will delete the charges. Since the length has got contracted by a factor gamma, the charges have remained the same. It means the charge density has gone up. But that is not a problem. Your charge density or lambda, you know how to calculate if the charge density is lambda times gamma. You calculate that. Then you find out what is the force between these two current carrying conductors, the charges if you like. Now, when you calculate that force, you find an expression which we gave yesterday, which is not the same as the actual force that the relativity would predict that what happens if something is moving in the line along that. So, there is a shortage. And this shortage he has to explain. So, notice with respect to the moving person, he has both charges which are giving rise to electric field and current steady currents which are steady because he is moving in a constant velocity, steady currents which are giving rise to magnetic field. So, he has to invoke something that because in my reference frame the charges are moving, there is an additional field which is the magnetic field. So, in that sense I said magnetic field and electric field are two manifestations of the same thing. Next question was can you experimentally verify it? The answer is both yes and no. What do I mean by that? See the point is this you notice that when you do electromagnetic waves you always talk about electric field you never talk about magnetic field. You do not talk about magnetic field though it could be a equally good way of talking about it. And the reason is that the strength of the magnetic field in such situation is 1 over c times the strength of the electric field. So, the magnetic field strength in an electromagnetic wave is not a prominent thing. So, you need okay, the relativistic effects in order to detect it. So, the answer is that if your person could move with speeds comparable to that of light which of course, is idiotic to talk about. Then this would be possible, but on the other hand experimental verification of the type of things that you are talking about is certainly not possible. Okay? Thank you.